Hi everybody, my name is Mr Barlow. Welcome to episode 27 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 3, Area of Study 1, and I'll be talking about some of the ways that molecular biology is used in medicine. In particular, things like prenatal diagnosis, gene therapy, and vaccine design are discussed. If you'd like to know more about any of the topics discussed, just click on the links that appear in the iTunes album art throughout the episode. Some diseases exist because of some sort of defect in an affected person's DNA. So they might have maybe a little bit too much DNA or be missing a little bit of DNA or the instructions that the DNA code for might be muddled up or wrong in some way. These diseases are known as inherited diseases and they're also called genetic disorders. And sometimes a whole chromosome may be involved. For example, you might have heard of Down syndrome, which is when you've got an extra copy of chromosome 21. And sometimes just a single gene can be involved. For example, the disease cystic fibrosis is caused by a single gene not being expressed properly. Current medical technology enables us to test for genetic disorders before a baby is even born. These are called prenatal tests, and some of them are non-invasive. For example, an ultrasound, which is carried out on virtually all babies, is um, non-invasive, and it involves just examining the baby for any physical defects, so it involves bouncing sound waves off a baby. Some other tests are invasive, as they require some cells from the fetus. So these, these tests enable us to actually test the DNA of the unborn baby. One of these is called chorionic villus sampling, or CVS. This test is carried out, carried out very early in pregnancy, at about six to eight weeks. And it involves removing a small piece of tissue from the chorion, which is a membrane that exists during pregnancy. And the membrane is genetically identical to the embryo or the baby, so you can you know, if you test that DNA, you'll know exactly what the DNA of the baby is. Another test is amniocentesis, which is carried out later in pregnancy, and it involves removing a sample of the amniotic fluid. So this is fluid that surrounds the fetus. It's not living tissue or anything, but just like most of the dust in your house is actually your and your family's dead skin cells, there are baby skin cells in the amniotic fluid, so in, in utero, in the womb. Um, So if we can get some amniotic fluid, we can then get some fetal cells and test those cells, test the fetus's DNA to see if they've got any sort of genetic disorder. The symptoms for some genetic disorders don't appear until later on in life. But because it's a genetic disorder, we can still test the person's DNA to see if they have the disease. So if we do this before symptoms appear, it's called pre-symptomatic testing. So we test the person's DNA before they're showing any symptoms of the disease. Huntington's disease or an increased susceptibility for breast cancer are some of the things that can be tested this way. If a person does have a genetic disorder which is caused by a single gene defect, so that little piece of DNA doesn't work properly, they can undergo a process called gene therapy to try and fix the disease. So in gene therapy, when just a single gene is defective or just a small portion of a person's DNA is defective, we get a functional piece of that DNA and then modify the genetic material of the living cells of the individual so that the genetic defect is corrected. There are two broad categories of gene therapy. In vivo gene therapy is given directly to a patient but ex vivo gene therapy is when a patient's cells are removed from their body manipulated outside the body, so in a laboratory somewhere, and then those person's cells, the patient cells, are returned to the individual. Now, if a person has a defective gene or a non-functional piece of DNA, we need to somehow get a functional piece of DNA into that person. And so we do this using a cloned gene. And to get the functional DNA, the cloned gene, into the patient, we need to use something called a vector. And a vector is normally a virus. So the vector is how we get the clone gene into the patient. Now the genetic material of viruses varies. Some viruses have got DNA, while others have RNA. As a general rule, viruses that have DNA generally replicate in the nucleus of the cell they infect, and viruses that have RNA generally replicate in the cytoplasm of the cells they infect. 
But with all rules, there's an exception. <clears throat> an, ex an exception to this is a group of RNA viruses known as retroviruses. So retroviruses are RNA viruses, but they replicate in the nucleus. What they do is they transform their RNA genetic material into an equivalent DNA molecule after they infect a cell. This DNA is then integrated into the host cell chromosome and then that viral DNA is reproduced just normally using the host cell's resources. So in gene therapy we get the functional piece of DNA or the clone gene and we put this into a vector, so often a virus, and then this virus is taken up by the host cell, the patient cells, and so because it's got the clone gene in it, the person's effectively cured because it'll now have a functional gene inside their cell, so this will do the job that their defective gene should be doing. So a special group of RNA viruses known as retroviruses, they're really good to use as vectors, but some DNA viruses, like adenoviruses, can also be used for gene therapy. Although, with adenoviruses, the newly inserted DNA doesn't replicate with the cells, so it only lasts for a short period of time. Whereas with retroviruses, because the DNA is integrated into the host cell, um, it'll replicate with the cells, so the, the therapy should last for a longer period of time. Now, not all diseases are genetic disorders. Lots of diseases are caused by infective agents, so things like viruses, bacteria, parasites. Now, if we want to cure these diseases, we can use a process called rational drug design. So in this process, what we do is we find out how an infective agent works against a cell, and then we use the information about how the infective agent works to design a drug that prevents the infective agent, you know, the bacteria, from being able to do what it does to make a person sick. So for example, if a disease causing agent like a parasite say, let's say the parasite generates an enzyme in its normal life cycle. What we can do is, we can design a drug that targets the active site of that particular enzyme so we can disable that enzyme. And if we do that, we can stop the parasite from going through its normal life cycle and maybe kill it and but basically we'll stop the disease. So this is what we do in rational drug design. Another use of molecular biology in medicine is the development of vaccines. Now when a person gets infected by some foreign material, say a bacteria or a virus, the body produces what's called antibodies. And antibodies recognize these special molecules called antigens on the foreign material, on the bacteria or the virus. And when the body's made antibodies, the antibodies can bind to the antigens on the foreign material. So basically the body can recognize the material as foreign, and then the body can take steps to destroy the foreign material or get rid of the infection. Now what's really tricky is that if you can isolate some of the antigens from an infective agent, let's say it's a bacteria, or even just get some dead or inactive form of the infective agent, so some dead bacteria, and then you get those antigens or the dead bacteria which contain antigens and inject them into a person, the person's immune system will still create antibodies against the foreign material, but it won't get sick. And that's basically what vaccination is. So you isolate some antigens and then you inject them into somebody's body. Their immune system creates antibodies against the antigens. So those antibodies, which are formed by the immune system, basically protect an individual against future infections by the bacteria or the infective agent, whatever had those particular antigens. So in future, whenever the body sees those particular antigens again, the antibodies it's already got will enable it to be recognized and destroyed as soon as it enters the body. And so that's basically how vaccines provide you with immunity. Now sometimes people get sick because they have a disease which affects the way their bodies produce a particular biological molecule. So maybe their bodies are unable to produce it or they don't produce it in um, significant quantities. 
So if this happens, it's possible to manufacture or genetically engineer the biological molecule that those people are missing and then inject it into them. So an example of just this kind of thing is diabetes. Diabetics can't produce enough of the hormone called insulin. So insulin is responsible for um, the level of glucose in the blood. So it, it uptakes glucose from the blood and stores it in the liver. So diabetics don't have enough insulin, but fortunately we can genetically engineer the molecule and then inject it into them. So this is done using bacteria. So the instructions to make the hormone insulin, so the DNA code, can be built and then inserted into a plasmid vector. So plasmids are these little um, circular chromosomes that exist in bacteria. So basically, you can get the DNA code for insulin, put that code into a plasmid chromosome, so it's a little circular chromosome, then put that plasmid into a bacterial cell, then that bacterial cell will you know, live and reproduce, and while doing that, the plasmid DNA, which includes the insulin instructions, will replicate and produce the hormone insulin. So then you've basically got this bacteria fact factory which is producing insulin molecules and then you can isolate the um, insulin molecules out of the bacteria factory, put it into vials, give it to diabetics and then they can um, inject this genetically engineered insulin molecule to overcome their insulin deficiency. And in fact, if people are deficient in other uh, molecules like human growth hormone or a protein involved in the clotting of blood called factor VIII, scientists are able to genetically engineer those molecules too. So we can't do it for everything, but we can do it for quite a few things, which is pretty amazing. Yay! Now, the last thing I'll talk about in this podcast is um, a way that drugs can be delivered by using what's called nanoparticles. So some current research with cancer treatment is using nanoparticles. So they're real, really small. They're about five nanometers in diameter, and they're made up of branched polymers called dendromers. And the important thing is that these nanoparticles are small enough to pass through a cell membrane. Now in this cancer treatment example, three compounds are attached to the dendroma. So there's the drug, so the drug to fight cancer or cure cancer. There's also some molecules of folic acid, which is a vitamin which the body needs. And there's also in fact a stain. So while they're doing this research, they're, they're putting a stain onto the dendroma. So there's three molecules. First of all, the drug, like I said, it kills the cancer cells. The fluorescent stain, so that allows the process to be monitored while the treatment's taking place. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is the molecules of folic acid, the vitamin. So folic acid is essential for cells which are reproducing. And cancer cells are actively reproducing, so they're, they're multiplying really fast, and so that's what cancer is. It's uncontrolled cellular growth. So because they're reproducing fast, they have a high need for folic acid. And in fact, cancer cells have 1,000 times more folate receptors on their plasma membranes than normal cells. So the molecules, the folate molecules on the nanoparticles are particularly attractive to the cancer cells. So as soon as these nanoparticles with the folic acid attached go near cancer cells, the cancer cells say, yeah, more folic acid and they take the nanoparticle inside their cell, but by taking the nanoparticle into their cell to get the folic acid, they're also getting the drug into their cell. So this drug poisons the cell, and the hope is that this kind of thing, this will end up curing cancer. So this is just amazing stuff. So molecular biology is resulting in, and already has resulted in, some huge advances in medicine. And that brings episode 27 of the VCE Biology Podcast to a close. I'm Mr Barlow, and thanks for listening. <laughs>